In the beginning, we have the mics uh, on, but I would like to welcome you all to the seminar, uh, the webinar, contributing to the SDGs to pro, pro board approaches for strengthening land tenure during the COVID pandemic. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And we appreciate the high interest and hope to share experience uh, that will be of value for all of you. And uh, of course, we hope the technology will be with us, but we have our support team, Sydney and Madeleine from Cadasta supporting us. And first, an introduction of myself. Uh, my name is Kent Nilsson, and I work as a senior technical advisor for Lammetriet, which is the Swedish Mapping, Cadaster and Land Registration Authority. And we at Lammetriet, as many of you might know, we have several projects around the world, uh, mainly funded by CEDA, the Swedish International Development Agency. And today we'll share our experiences from one of our projects, the ITP project for five East African countries uh, in which uh, I'm also one of the mentors. You will meet several presenters during this webinar and I will introduce them briefly along the way. Some short instructions for the webinar. Uh, as I told you, we have a technical support, uh, Sydney and Madeleine from Cadasta, who will help us facilitate this. Uh, and uh, we want you all to please shut down cameras and microphones and keep them off uh, to save bandwidth because we're all different people from different parts of the world and the uh, internet is not always on our side. And the material used today will be shared with all of you after the webinar. Sydney will, will send you a link so you can access all the material. As you can see in the agenda, uh, we have this, these bullets, the times, uh, are indicative and uh, will hope to, to meet your expectations during the day. And as you can see, the last bullet is questions, answers, and discussions and wrap up. And I hope you can all save your questions uh, for the Q&A. But please type them in in the chat and they will be addressed <laughs> during Q&A. So you can stop typing in questions at any time and we'll deal with them as uh, many as possible on, of them during the Q&A. Thank you. Next slide, please. As you might know, Lammetriet is the Swedish Mapping and Cadastre and Land Registration Authority. We originate from back to 1628, and we are one of the oldest authorities in Sweden and one of the oldest land authorities in the world. We'd like to share that we contribute to social and economic development for sustainable Sweden. We do this in cooperation with other authorities and the civil society. And at, in addition to this uh, important work we do in Sweden, we have an international department where I work. We have a number of CEDA funded projects running and we have been active internationally for many years throughout the world. Now we are focusing mainly on Sub-Saharan Africa and countries close to the European Union. Uh, I will now just let you meet my colleague, Mr. Lennart Vasteson, who will introduce you to the ITP program and the work we are doing in Rwanda. Next slide and over to you, Lennart. Thank you very much, Kent. Wonderful to be here. Um, I've just recently taken over as a program manager for the ITP programs, and uh, I've worked at Landmetriet internationally since 2009, mainly in Africa and in the Balkans. Uh, ITP stands for International Training Program and is also sponsored by CEDA. And ITP, the overall concept is to strengthen capacity of individuals and organizations in the land sector to make a difference on the ground. But to me, it's also a lot about the cooperation between government authorities, institutions, and civil society. Thank you. Next slide, please. So this is the picture showing that the ITP runs for We lost you now, Lennart. We cannot hear you. Sir. Leonard, you've you've gone quiet on us. We'll give Leonard 
a moment to get back on track. Hello, have I been away for a long time? Yeah, just when you we switch to this slide, you, 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 you went quiet. So please start over okay. with this slide. Sorry about that. Uh, so, so the ITP runs for five years with different themes uh, every year. We have now finished year three, which is land registration. And that's where we're going to see an example from. Um, there are five new participants per country each year from Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda, Zambia, and Tanzania. And uh, the annual circle that you can see on the right-hand side starts in September with a Swedish phase and is then followed by a change project that runs until April. Each country has its own Swedish mentor. Kent is, is one of them, and uh, they make two trips to assist in the change project. Uh, so next slide, please. In Rwanda, we also have a bilateral project between RLMUA and Lantnetariet. And this is also funded by CEDA. And the Swedish team leader, Lars Lindgren, is resident in Rwanda. There are many short-term Swedish experts that are involved in this project in, in specific areas. We can go to the next slide. And here you can see that the project components are having different targeted outcomes. They are surveying, mapping, and land use planning, land administration, legal and policy framework, and capacity development. Uh, a lot of effort are also put into this project about awareness activities, campaigns, and collaborations with NGOs. Uh, the Swedish experts work directly with their counterparts at RLMUA. And this means that, for instance, ICT people uh, from Lab Madrid are working with ICT people from RLMUA, building a strong working relationship and really getting to know each other and trust each other. And we've seen during the COVID-19 that this has meant that the Swedish experts have been able to continue their work by distance and electronic communication. But as you all know, nothing beats meeting each other in person and carrying out the work side by side. So that was a, a short introduction to the ITP and, and the bilateral project in, in Rwanda. So back to you, Kent. Thank you, Lennart. And uh, this slide uh, is an attempt to show you that we have tried to analyze our work, what we do in this bilateral project, uh, how it contributes to the different SDGs. We have done this analysis together with our sustainability advisors at Land Madrid, who's doing the similar, the similar work internally at Land Madrid. And Rwanda, the bilateral Rwanda project is the first one, the pilot, where we try to find the modalities, find the structure, how can we map what we do to the SDGs and how can we show that we are contributing. We have also done this analysis for our project in Liberia. Uh, on the left hand side, you can see the SDGs that are in focus for Rwanda. Quality education, decent work and economic growth, etc. And on the right hand side, you can see the, the diagram uh, showing what we contribute in our project in Rwanda. The scale, uh, the, the x-axis uh, is the, the work effort we put into it. The scale is uh, relative, meaning that it's in this project comparing the SDGs with each other, not with other projects or, or other countries. And as you can see, uh, the blue lines, the squares, the rectangles are marking the SDGs that are in focus for Rwanda, which the ones you have on the left hand side. As you can see, we're contributing in this project, for example, to SDG 1.4, equal rights to ownership, basic services, technology, and economic resources. And also 5A, equal rights. And, and uh, those are not marked uh, with rectangles because they are not in focus for Rwanda as a nation, but we are still contributing to them. As for a couple of examples, we are contributing to SDGs that are in focus is 16.6, uh, develop effective, accountable, and transparent institutions. Since 
as Lena uh, explained to you, we're working with Rwanda Land Management Use Authority, uh, and the focus for the project is capacity building. We we think that uh, we see that this is uh, contributing to this SDG. In addition, we contribute to SDG 1717, which is to encourage uh, effective partnership. And those two are examples that we contribute to in this project, and it's also in focus for Rwanda as a nation. And like I said in the beginning, this is a work analysis we're just started doing, and it, it's it's still in in the in the makings. So we have still not really figured out how to display it, how to make it visible. And so you're one of the first audiences to see to see this. Uh, so I'll now uh, want you to take the next slide and uh, hand over to Frank from Cadasta for a brief introduction of who they are who he is and what kind of tools that were used for the pilot project in Rwanda. Over to you, Frank. Great, thanks for that, Kent. Uh, happy to give a quick introduction of Cadasta before we dive further into the, the work in Rwanda and John Baptiste can give it, get, really dive into those details. Um, but for us at Cadasta, we've been very excited to, to assist and participate in the ITP. Um, and seeing this opportunity to leverage quick win projects that prove out uh, possibilities um, and, and linking in, I think, both the government officials as well as civil society through the ITP participation. But we'll hear more about that in a moment. With that, I'll dive further into Cadasta. Um, in brief, Cadasta is a nonprofit foundation. We're based in the US, but, but we're globally and really with a focus on providing the technical support and tools to communities that are left out of the formal and tenure system, which we know is unfortunately the majority in many parts of the world. And the way we do this at Cadasta is, is really working to bridge the gap between top-down government-led uh, government systems and data standards and bottom-up approach to community and participatory mapping that are, are well-known and well-understood. And Cadasta um, really sees ourselves as incrementally working with partners to strengthen their tenure. Uh, and each one of our partners ends up working a little bit differently because there's different expectations of what might be feasible. What is a secure enough right that is cost effective, achievable in the short term? So while some partners might be leading directly to a freehold title, others might be going to a, a certificate of customary occupancy or starting with advocacy. And the way we do this at Cadasta is in part through leveraging technology. Um, our partners use a range of tools from drone imagery, satellite imagery, cloud computing. We've experimented with blockchain. Um, we regularly use satellite imagery and mobile phones, tablets in the, in the field, but really adapt those, those tools and approaches to the local needs. But at the heart of our work is really a platform to manage this data. So our, our, our partners are organizations that are collecting and managing this data with an eye towards leveraging it in some way. And our platform is secure, accessible, open where possible, uh, keeping in mind that the limitations and risks around personally identifiable information. And then we also work with our partners to help them decide what, what information they may or may not want to share with the world at large. And this is, of course, supported by our technical support, but also the mobile tools we use in the field. So on one hand, we're managing the data on the platform, but we're also taking those tools in the field to collect data. And that, again, that might vary by partner and could be satellite imagery on, on paper maps in one case, or a smartphone and tablet with drone imagery on another. And just to look quickly at where Cadast is working, we're now um, in about 33 countries, um, primarily Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and South Southeast Asia, but excited to, to just be reaching 5 million people on our platform, uh, impacting the formal rights of well over 600,000 people now, uh, and really seeing how partners are leveraging and using this data. We'll hear a little bit more about that later. With that, I'll let Kent introduce the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Uh, now, when we know at least a little bit about uh, the tools and who, who Cadasta is, and previously Lennart also told you about what the ITP is, uh, we want to dig into the, the main subject. 
the experiences from that we project specifically in Rwanda. And I will uh, hand over to Jean Baptiste. Welcome, Jean Baptiste. Thank you very much, Kent. Uh, my name is Jean Baptiste Wiode uh, Mukarie, acting head of land administration department at Rwanda Land Management and Use Authority. Uh, I'm very uh, glad to be part of this webinar where I'm going to share with you our experience on the use of cadastre tool in tracking land transactions. Next slide, please. Uh, before I go ahead with the use of cadastre tool, I would like to share with you the overview of land administration in Rwanda uh, I would like to start with uh, the land reform uh, that was uh, conducted uh, since 2004, where the government uh, uh, performed different activities, including the establishment of legal and institutional framework, the land tenure program, uh, land tenure organization program, development of uh, of land information, information system and the development of land use master plan. Uh, there, there was a, a land tenure pro regularization program, as I mentioned earlier, that was conducted from 2009 and 2013, uh, where uh, all land has been demarcated and registered. And uh, uh, land certificate were uh, issued to landowners and uh, in total in that program 10.4 million have been demarcated and registered. Another achievement is the establishment of the land administration information system uh, which was develop developed to support the maintenance of data collected during the, the systematic land registration and also uh, this system stands for the land register. Uh, currently, the land register in Rwanda has in total uh, 11.4 million parcels registered. Next, please. Uh, I try to show you how uh, the, um, the land tenure regularization program uh, was conducted as you can see, we used the local community uh, who uh, provided information in order uh, to, to make that um, program success successful. Uh, there are different steps of uh, uh, land, the, of systematic land registration, how the land systematic land registration was conducted, uh, including the demarcation of, of boundaries where we use the auto photo, uh, print auto photo, and we use also uh, para surveyors from local community. Uh, they helped us to demarcate the, uh, the boundaries of their parcels in the presence of uh, the, the landowners, neighbors, and also local leaders. As you can see, uh, the para surveyor was just. Uh, the marketing, the boundaries of the parcels uh, in collaboration with the uh, local community. And also we use the cell land committee. Uh, a, cell, a cell is uh, an, adim, an administrative entity. Uh, and uh, in, each sec, in each cell, we have a land committee. That committee was used also to record all information regarding landowners, including their identity uh, and the other related information. Uh, also, there was a data processing, both spatial data and also non-spatial data. We used them to, to, to we used some uh, staff, casual staff to enter the data also to process the spatial data by using RxGIS and, uh, to, and to, to, to digitize the passwords. Uh, and finally, we managed to issue uh, 
land certificate to land owners. And it was a big achievement for owners to have uh, their land titles. And it is very important because uh, uh, owners are using these titles uh, for uh, their development they, because they can uh, they can give their their, their parcels as collateral for the bank to get uh, to give them the, the loan. Next, please. Also, after the systematic land registration, uh, a system was developed. The the system called land administration information system uh, in order to maintain the land information that was recorded during the systematic land registration. And this system uh, also is very important uh, in the, as far as the land management activities are, uh, are, are concerned. And also the, this, the the data that is uh, kept in our land register is very important and it is used by different other uh, government uh, agencies and also it uh, it is also very useful because it is it can be used for uh, mortgage registration there is a, a system that is connected to our system also, the tax correction can be used in the permit, a constru construction permit, in agriculture. All those systems are linked to our system. And it is very important to have the updated land information uh, because if uh, the data that we have, it is not updated, we can mislead all those systems. Next, please. Uh, af during the maintenance phase, we are, face we are facing a very uh, big challenge of informal land transaction. An informal land transaction, according uh, to Rwanda law, it is uh, an, a transaction that is not formalized, that is not done before the competent uh, notary. And according to land law, the transfer has to be done before a competent notary. If it is not done before the, not, the competent notary, it is informal. But in practice, uh, many people are used to approach local leaders when they want to sell or to buy, when there is a donation, inheritance exchange, or another land transfer for the approval, because they, uh, they are still using their informal arrangement. Uh, and this form uh, of transfer is uh, one of the source of land conflict. As the landowner uh, fl can flood the entry, sell one parcel to different persons because the, the transaction was not recorded, it can sell uh, uh, more, than, more than one time. And also the World Bank uh, survey revealed that there is a rise of informal transactions. And uh, they indicated that 87% of land transactions, especially in rural area, were not registered formally. Also, there is a disconnection between local leaders. As I mentioned, they, they are involved informally in land transactions. And also there's a discussion between them and uh, formal land, land actors it, as far as uh, the flow of information regarding informal transaction is concerned. Also, uh, the Rwanda Land Management Visual Authority has recognized this challenge and put much effort on awareness raising uh, from through public uh, campaigns. But uh, although there was enormous, enormous uh, achievement in reducing informal land transaction, there are many changes that are still not captured in the land register. Next, please. Uh, 
Uh, during international training program in 2019, the team Rwanda has chosen a project that will contribute to contribute to for the fight against the informal transaction. The title of that project was the using informal transaction by using proper based approach. And the objective was to bridge the gap between uh, local leaders and the formal actors. And we use the cadaster tool where uh, the cadaster tool was installed in the smartphones. And uh, those smartphones were given to the local leaders in order to collect information. Because as I mentioned, many people uh, come to them for the approval when they they said the land or, we, or if there is a, a donation, etc. And uh, at that occasion, the land, uh, the village, the village leader can uh, directly uh, collect that information about the, the seller and the buyer. And that information that was kept by the local leaders was directly transferred to uh, the system and the, at the sector level, the land notary was able to uh, know the people who, uh, who transacted on their land in order to plan how to approach them so that they can formalize their, their transaction. Next, please. Uh, this is our project area which is uh, uh, located uh, in Hotsi sector, Msanzi district in Northern province. This is a map of Rwanda with the, the specific project area. We have chosen that district because uh, it is uh, a secondary city. It is uh, at the, se the second level of classification of cities in Rwanda. It's a, a, a big, uh, it's, a, it's a big city. And also uh, during the systematic land registration in that district, it was the, the first district where we, we recorded many uh, polygam uh, many uh, issues related to polygamous families and also many land conflict related in, during the systematic land registration. Also in that sector, uh, we assume that there should be main transaction, but when you look at the numbers recorded, the transaction recorded during, in, uh, during uh, 2018, we realized that a few uh, transactions were recorded compared to other sectors. But and in that area, there is uh, there are some infrastructure like uh, technical universities that, that attract many people to come to buy that uh, in that area. Next, please. Uh, this is our, the team Rwanda. Here we're in Sweden where uh, we, we received the, the uh, training uh, before we start our change broach project. Uh, the, we were five members, two from Rwanda Land Management on the user authority and two from Chigari City and one from one housing authority. As I mentioned, we use cadaster tool in tracking land, land transaction. And the cadaster tool can be used on uh, ta tablets, can be used on a mobile phone, or it can be used on the computer. Next, please. Uh, we have been trained uh, how to use the cadaster tool by cadaster organization they sent us a, a trainer from kenya and here uh, uh, the trainer was just uh, training us how to collect data on the field by using tablet next please Uh, after uh, being trained how to collect data by using Daxter tool, the team organized trainings for local leaders on how to use uh, the 
cluster tool in the data collection. As you can see, the local leaders, including the local uh, the village leaders, say land committee, and also uh, the uh, some district staff, they they, they attend uh, these training sessions. Next, please. We we gave some, two phones to the select village. Uh, in that uh, in that uh, study area, in that project area, we selected two villages. Uh, uh, depending on our, uh, our budget, we selected only two villages, and the the chair uh, person of those uh, two villages. They were given some a smart two smartphones in order to equip them with the cadastral tool so that they can use it in data collection uh, for uh, tracking land transactions. Uh, and here we were just with our mentor, Lash from uh, Sweden. Uh, he was our mentor and also he's the project, uh, uh, project coordinator here in Rwanda. Next, please. Uh, and we organized some awareness uh, in order to make our project uh, to be uh, to be known by all people from that uh, that project area. And also, we explained to the local community how important it is uh, to formalize their land transactions. Also, the local community was given the time to ask their questions, and the team managed to answer all, all, all questions. And also, the local leaders were also uh, participating. Also, they, they participated in that uh, awareness campaign. And also, we 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 asked people to to use these advantages so that the their land transaction can be. Uh, decoded, even though it is an informal way, uh, but it is good to have data than uh, having nothing. Next. Uh, the local leaders managed to collect non spatial data by using the cadastral tool, as I mentioned. The cadastral tool is a one survey one, two, three, uh, and we also customized the the form because the the the, the form that is in the this in this cadastral tool can be uh, customized according to the local context uh, and also we we used our local language we tried to to translate the, the form in in Kinyarwanda our local language and uh, local leaders were able to collect different uh, non spatial data, including the name of the seller, uh, the civil status, the transaction type, if it is the sale, donation exchange, etc. The sale price, we are applicable. The picture of land title, the person number, name, and ID of the new land owner, also the location of the person, the province, district, sector. And also, as well as this, this cell. Please, next. The data that was collected by local leaders was just uh, sent to uh, the next level, the sector level, where the land notary was able to know uh, people who uh, who did land transactions in that uh, in those two villages and from uh, this information the land notary uh, was able to contact those people in order to come to the sector office in order to formalize their land transactions next please uh, this slide show the report the cadastral tool can also generate some reports. Uh, and this report shows that uh, the, oh, the, the total number of 
land transaction recorded during our change project was 41 land transactions. And the, uh, they were captured uh, bef uh, uh, between February 17 to March 12. 12. As you can see, uh, they, they managed to, to capture uh, many transactions as possible. Next, please. What are the benefits of using cadastral tool? Uh, from our experience, uh, we used the cadastral tool and we realized that it is very simple to be used by ordinary people from lo local community. Those people, um, they are ordinary, they didn't uh, too much uh, of, um, of uh, courses like uh, as like those who are related to land administration or, or others, but uh, they, they manage to use this tool. It is flexible and easy for, to, to customize. As I mentioned, we managed to translate our, the form in Rwanda. Also, it helped the, the village there to, to understand very well. Also, it is multiple, multiple functions, both spatial and non-spatial. Also, the data can be uh, collected offline and stored on the phone, and the data can, uh, will be uploaded on the server when the internet is restored or if the user reaches where the internet is full. It is very good uh, like, uh, tool to be used by local communities. Next, please. What are the challenges that we faced? First of all, if, as I mentioned, we faced the, the problem of language. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the tool is in English and uh, the local leaders uh, do not speak English. And, but we, as I mentioned, we try to, to translate the form, but uh, some part of the application are totally in English, it cannot be tran translated. Also, there's a, a challenge of security and accessibility of data. All that that uh, collected by local leaders were just uh, stored on the server, which is located outside our country. Uh, we have been told that uh, the, the servers are located in U U USA. And, and uh, we, and even for the creation of accounts, it it required to to ask those who are uh, who are in USA to create our our accounts for using the tool. Next, please. As recommendations, we recommend that. There should be a legal framework enabling village leaders to be part of the legal system. As I, I mentioned, they do their job of approving land transaction in an informal way. Uh, secondly, uh, to extend the use of this tool in other part of the country, as it is a very useful tool that can help our country to monitor the informal land transactions. Also, to establish a partnership uh, with Cadastra, Cadastra Foundation in order to continue to have access to the data collected during uh, the change project. Uh, also, to get financial support, either from the government or from other development partners in order to, to extend the project in other part of the, the country. Also, uh, to integrate data that was collected by village leaders by using a data tool in the national land administration system. Uh, even though uh, the data that was collected, it is about the informal transaction, uh, but we, we it is possible uh, to integrate that data and to change their status if 
the uh, those who are concerned are uh, come to uh, the land notary for formalization. So uh, it is very important to to integrate that data back because it is useful. Uh, next, please. I think the, it is the it was the, the last uh, slide. Uh, thank you very much for your your attention. I hand over the the floor to the to my colleague who will be the next. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean Baptiste. Uh, it was a very informative presentation, and I fully agree that uh, this pilot project addressed uh, a crucial issue not only for Rwanda but also for a lot of other countries: the informal land transactions. And as you said, it's, it's, uh, you rather have some data than no data at all. And uh, I'm happy to see that we have a lot of questions coming in the chat. And please continue posting your questions. We will address, uh, address them accordingly during the, during the Q&A session later. Uh, now I will uh, quickly give the floor to, to Frank uh, to share some other examples of using similar tools and methods and how they can be used uh, during the COVID pandemic. Over to you, Frank. Great. Thanks for that, Kent. Um, and like you, excited to see these questions coming in and, and looking forward to the discussion on the work in Rwanda. Um, I, I think the webinar has generated a lot of interest in part because of the role Rwanda's played in demonstrating what's possible in fit for purpose approaches. And perhaps this is the next evolution there. So I'll, I'll move quickly so we can get back to the, the Q&A and the discussion because I think, John baptiste there, there are many people who would like to hear more from you. But as you noted, Kent, um, uh, particularly in the COVID context, we've seen cha approaches change uh, in, re in regards to data collection. And just in the case of this Rwanda, we can see that data collection window was small, February to March. And then as COVID set in, uh, field visits really drew to a close. It made it tough for a lot of us to do our work. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a couple of examples of, of projects that we've had and that we can see um, why these projects continued to be active collecting data over the last nine months, or how they modified their approaches and, and invented new ways to collect data in the context of restricted movement, et cetera. And I'm actually gonna present two before turning it over to my colleague, Justice. Um, you might've seen Justice in an earlier picture, but Justice is our East Africa-based um, lead for work in Africa. He's uh, out of Nairobi and supported the work in Rwanda and Kenya and can, can speak to those specific projects uh, better than I. So with that, you know, as we've all seen over the last year, you know, rolling lockdowns, changes in behaviors, limitations in movement, uh, and moving in waves, you know, I, I think we thought, geez, just a month ago that we'd be returning to normal, uh, to a degree of normal travel in, in Africa um, in this quarter. And as we've seen, the numbers are flaring in Southern Africa and it has us rethinking uh, when travel will really return to a degree that will make it safe. But in that context, how are we still collecting data? There's still a need for information. Uh, and I think what we've seen is that data and local level data is even more critical. And there's a recognition that oftentimes the formal authorities don't have access to information in rural areas, in urban informal communities. A lot of this data is held locally, is held mentally, or you know, might be held in a place where it's of, of limited validity or of questionable. Has it been validated as an authoritative data? And certainly in the case of property rights, this is critical information. Uh, this, this, this land information data. And looking at one of our projects in Uganda, uh, we were excited to see how they were able to continue doing work over the last months. And in part, I think it's because of the approach they've, they've elected to take um, due, to, due to their experience and learnings over the last years. Uh, Uganda's benefited from significant support from the World Bank, as, uh, which helped them to build out a national land information system over the course of about 10 years. But the, there is a realization that that information system doesn't actually have a lot of information because there's a, a gap in data on particularly rural land rights. 
so Uganda has made made the move to to switch the approach and allow for certificates of customary occupancy to be captured in a variety of ways as long as they align with the data standards set out by the government. And that's really opened up the potential for local level data capture. And it, working in about 10 districts now, um, we've seen where district level officials, both from the government as well as customary authorities, are able to continue collecting data because they're working in the communities that they're a part of. And they're able to submit that data electronically to the National Land Information System for review. So it's been exciting to see them continue moving forward and now looking at issuance of titles despite these limitations on movement. One other example I'll jump to is in, is in Haiti, where CADEST has been working for almost two years now supporting Habitat for Humanity um, with uh, uh, funding from USAID. And, you know, Haiti's suffered from a lack of land information exacerbated by the earthquake in 2010, resulting in an incredibly high degree of informality to the extent that even local municipalities lack the basic data they need to deliver services, to plan for infrastructure, to collect a base level of revenue, to be able to assure a level of security for their citizens, something very much in demand. Our work had been on track and moving quickly um, as uh, in line with our work plan until about that March of 2020. And as the restrictions occurred and we saw the, the ability to get to the field drop, the team began to think about how can we move on with data collection despite these limitations. And so we've been doing a little bit of testing and, and working with ESRI to develop a model for uh, automated feature detection. So let's identify the building outlines and partial uh, parcel outlines using very high resolution drone imagery. Uh, in this case, it's two and a half, three centimeters. So that's allowing uh, an initial demarcation of boundaries um, that can be validated later once field work is possible. But meanwhile, many of the community members are being reached by telephone, et cetera, to fill out the additional data. So this combination of drone imagery and artificial intelligence is allowing that, that data collection to move forward despite these limitations we felt. And I'll stop there and turn it over to my colleague Justice to speak uh, speaking a little bit about some experience in Kenya. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Frank, uh, um, and everyone on this call. Um, I'm happy to be on this webinar. My name is Justice Wombai. Um, as Frank uh, mentioned earlier on, I lead uh, Cadastra projects uh, in Eastern uh, Central Africa. Um, um, the earlier presenters have been talking about the cadastral tool and how it has been used to do land recordation and support communities in land rights. But come uh, COVID-19 and the issues that came with it, um, we started to discover that um, we can use these tools to do more than just um, recording land rights. And in, and in that particular case, I want to give you a story of what happened uh, with Pamoja Trust, um, uh, uh, one of our partners uh, in Nairobi, Kenya. In July 2020, the Kenyan Ministry of Water and Sanitation announced that the government was um, gearing up to implement a second phase of demolition. We had an initial uh, demolition where people were um, just from their houses in the middle of the night and left in the cold. Uh, and now they were coming a second phase of uh, land reposition demolition in what was called six areas in Nairobi. Uh, this was um, in order to pave way for the expansion of water and sewerage projects. The six um, uh, areas that um, had been marked um, were kind of defined as health hazard and, um, and the reclamation of that land was necessary uh, if uh, the city was to be sustainable. And um, I'm sure when you hear that um, introduction, you're asking why then, why why even preventing um, demolition of um, settlement within uh, what is a hazard? But to us um, and to our partners working with this uh, with these people within the in, in in this city, they knew these areas were not hazard areas, and they knew these areas which were kind of called hazard. There were settlements, there were source of livelihood for people, for the urban, what is called the urban poor. Um, 
and we had to do something. We had to build some evidence so that we can counter this narrative and uh, help communities champion for their rights and um, to be able to halt uh, the demolition. So what happened? Um, quickly, uh, partnering with our, um, with the Pamoja Trust, we were able to conduct a risk analysis. And um, this is happening in July 2020. We can't go out in the field uh, to collect data due to COVID-19. And we have to find ways in which we can be able to get that data. And we don't want just to get any data, that, but we want to get almost accurate data. So um, we knew the points. We knew all the facilities that had been highlighted. We were able to plot them on a satellite imagery and, uh, uh, and, ordered, and then we did a buffer. Uh, we did a, a 100 meters uh, buffer, a 200 meters radius buffer and another 500 meters radius buffer. In that we were able to outline all the settlements that were at risk of being um, demolished. Um, and doing that, we also had to ensure that we had more data on it. We, you know, when we talk about six areas, we talk about settlement, we are not like pinpointing what exactly we're talking about. We had to do something. And with that, we decided we're going to talk about the number of people in these areas. Um, um, and do we couldn't um, go to the field, we decided to use um, high resol uh, region, uh, resolution um, uh, population data from Facebook, uh, data for good project. And we were able to overlay it on top of the areas which we had highlighted. Remember um, talking about the 100 meters, 200 meters and 500 meters radius. And that we were able to pinpoint that 71,000 people were at risk of being um, evicted. This information, we're able to use one of our tools called StoryMap. Um, as you're going to get this uh, presentation, please click on the link that we provided there. You will be able to see the story map that we were able to put out. And uh, story map is a combination of both uh, spatial information and narrative information. So you're able to provide information that is evidence-based. And in this, um, this uh, respect, uh, spatial uh, evidence. Um, this information was shared with the community members. Um, it was shared uh, with the housing coalition and they were able to use this information to be able to start uh, discussions with the government, uh, initiate discussion with the local leaders. And we are happy to report that we are able, due to this, we were able to um, plead with the government and we were able to pursue it to halt all the um, demolition. Next slide, please. Also, um, uh, Jim Baptiste, um, our colleague from Rwanda, uh, spoke about the ITP project in Rwanda. Um, and I've seen from the comment section, um, people asking, uh, does ITP only happen in, in Rwanda? It also happened in Kenya. In Kenya, uh, ITP project uh, involved uh, two, um, two officials from the Ministry of Lands and Physical Planning. Uh, two officials from the National Land Commission and one official uh, from um, an international NGO known as Transparency International. And for the ITP project um, in Kenya, um, the members of the team uh, discovered that there was a, a gap when it, com when it comes to the implementation of the Community Land Act of 2016 and it is regulation in that we had been given very good act with a very good uh, regulations, but there was no uh, schedule that provided for a template for registration of communities within community lands, of community members within community land. And so the team, um, the form that you're seeing on the slide, they created that uh, form. And you remember the, um, the Community Land Act of 2016 uh, uh, provides that each and every member within a community must be registered. Um, each and every member above the age of 18 years must be registered. And when we talk about community lands in Kenya, we are talking about around 2 million people. And we realize with this form, it will be tedious. One, it will be very hard and it will be time consuming. We thought of a way in which we could quickly transform this um, form into a digital format that, uh, and, and that will be able to support uh, quick and uh, efficient 
data collection. So with this form, we were able to con um, convert it into digital format within the Cadastra platform. And um, they were able to go and test it on the ground in Matsabit County. And within a period of two hours, they had already registered around 100 community members. And uh, they had collected their location data, they had collected their IDs, pictures of their IDs, they had collected uh, their signatures, uh, they had collected all the information about them and the children and their spouses. And, um, and um, the team felt that this was a very powerful tool that could be used in, um, in Kenya and will support uh, data collection uh, and registration of community going forward. And with that, um, the team, uh, we also able to present this uh, to NGOs in Kenya, and we have received a considerable amount of, uh, of interest um, in, in this endeavor. Um, I think in the next slide, um, I'll pass it on to uh, Frank to continue. Thank you, Justice. And with that, I will actually pass it back to Kent. <laughs> thank you, Frank, for passing the ball so quickly. And thank you, Justice, for sharing uh, the experiences, especially from, from Kenya. And uh, it's nice to have you with us today, Justice, because you'll be training uh, our ITP teams from, from, from different African countries. And uh, I look forward to continuing the cooperation. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll just shoot straight and I will send the, the first question to my colleague, Leonard Vasteson. Uh, it, it is, do you have any examples of uh, collaborations between government and civil society from the ITP program? Yes, there are a number that I can mention. Uh, one is in Tanzania where codes and an NGO working with customary land issues have been working together with the, the National Land Use Planning Commission and African Wildlife Foundation after getting to know each other and they've collaborated in different initiatives. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, participants from uh, another project that we have in Liberia that has visited Rwanda to learn more and I believe both the bilateral project and the I2P has, has uh, shown that Rwanda has come a long way and, and uh, it's made an impact. And, and uh, so there's, there's uh, quite, quite a few examples that you can give there. Thank you, Lennart. And I will throw the next question on Frank. Frank, do you have any examples of projects, countries or organizations that have been using your tools uh, and platform for a longer time and that are still using them? Uh, and an additional question in this area is, have you seen any development in the usage and, and what are the long-term benefits? Over to you, Frank. All right, thanks for that, Kent. Um, yeah, you know, that, that's a great question. And we've actually had a number of, of partners that um, you know were, were amongst those first uh, pilot test cases when Cadasta was founded in 2015. And we were really as much learning from partners or potential partners about their needs as we were in, in you know, demonstrating some of the initial tools we've developed. Um, and so some of those partners were qu quite instrumental in defining how the Cadasta tools have evolved and what we offer. Uh, one actually is, is, is one that Justice works quite closely with in Kenya there, uh, the, the Ogiek People's Development Program. And with another partner, Namati, we began assessing their needs probably back in early 2015. Uh, and our first move was very much around capturing the data for advocacy so that the Ogiek people could, could advocate for the recognition of their rights to a degree by the Kenyan government. But we've seen that really uh, um, uh, change over the years and moving now to you know, mapping and managing the community lands, documenting some 3,500 people across multiple communities and, and, and evolving from advocacy to land use to land management and eventually we hope formal full recognition of their rights. Um, and that's the exciting part for us, you know, seeing when partners are, are collecting and, and formalizing their rights or strengthening their rights is, is, is great. But then when they take the next step to leverage those rights and, and how are they being used, I think that's where we see the real change. And we have other partners that are getting to that point of now, you know, taking that data of community land and using it to create 
uh, forest management plans or community land use plans. Again, leveraging that data. Um, so that's what we'll look forward more forward to in the coming years. Thanks, Kent. Thank you, Frank. And uh, I will direct the next question to Jean Baptiste. Uh, and I know he's struggling with the, the power outage, uh, but I hope you can be can manage to answer this question, Jean Baptiste. We have several questions uh, regarding resisting arguments in local communities. Why people do not want to formalize land tenure? Uh, so, Sean Baptiste, what is the main resisting arguments in the local communities not to formalize the land? Thank you, Kent. There are a number of uh, reasons. Uh, we can uh, we can say that uh, the majority of them they say that the, there's a, there's a problem related to to the cost and the uh, and procedures and also the attitude because the, some people they don't uh, they don't they don't take the, the land registration is maybe as a priority because the because they are, they are busy with their businesses and they don't have to, time to go uh, to formalize. Yes, the, the cost and also the attitude of the, the people. Uh, but for the cost, the government of Rwanda is, uh, is planning to, to, to revise the, the land services uh, tariffs. And there is, there is a draft uh, presidential order which has to be approved by the government, the, by the cabinet. But still, People have to be uh, sensitized and uh, the, we have to raise awareness among people. Thank you. Thank you, Shoma Pist. And now I will continue uh, with you. We have another question in the same area. Uh, it's addressing concerns related to tax payments. Uh, some rural people may fear will be overly burdensome. Did you have these arguments as well that people don't want to register because they're afraid of, of taxes coming up? I No, I don't think so. Because if the, the land is registered, it's, if it is already registered, the tax authority will send, will send the bill to, uh, to whosoever who is registered. So the, 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 buy, the seller will not, uh, will not uh, allow the land to continue to be registered on, on his or her name. It will, uh, he will ask the buyer to come and to go to the land notary for formalization. In that case, I, I don't think so, that uh, people fear tax. Uh, so that they cannot register their land. Thank you, Sean Baptiste. And I will give you one more question because we move, uh, before we move on to, to some other, <coughs> maybe Frank or Lennart. Uh, the question is relating to the work you've done in the, in the pilot with the cadaster tools. Have women benefited or lost? Is it good or bad for women, the work you're doing with the cadaster tool? Uh, in our change project, we focused on the women rights uh, because uh, women are part of the community. And, but uh, in Rwanda, uh, because all land is registered, uh, and also it was registered on both uh, men and women. In that case, uh, the uh, women rights on, uh, on land are very pro are, are protected. But in the case of land transaction, uh, before there was no requirement to provide a, a civil status certificate. Uh, but now we, 
we decided to, to include in the requirement the certificate, uh, civil status certificate, if it is if the applicant is single or it is married, they have to prove their, their status so that they can protect the rights of women on land. Thank you, Jean-Baptiste. Uh, now I will let Frank have a couple of questions and they are related to, to storing data. Uh, mm -hmm. One is, how do you make sure uh, community data are secured? And another uh, question in the same area is, uh, how can you connect the data collected with your tools to, to other existing data? For example, the live system in Rwanda. Yeah. Great, great questions and happy to address that. I mean, the, the question of, of data ownership, data security, data privacy is, is critical in any circumstance, particularly though when talking about personal information, which property rights has an inherent personal information component. And, and maybe just to add one, one point to John Baptiste's, uh, the conversation regarding addressing women's rights. Um, in addition to the approach of, uh, uh, of making sure they're on the documents and checking their civil, uh, 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 civil registries is also incorporating women throughout the process. And while that's often a, um, you know, a real point of, uh, of conversation with partners, shall we say, it was certainly not the case in Rwanda. Um, we, we really see that it's not just about documenting the women's name, but ensuring they're an integral part of the process, that they're collecting the data, managing the data, using the data throughout that, that data life cycle. Because we know that you know, just changing who shows up at a door can dictate responses. Uh, but all of that said, in the case of Rwanda, from the outset, it was a very balanced team. So it wasn't the same issue we face elsewhere. Now, in regards to that, that, that uh, the data storage and the security of it, you know, the security was a really a key aspect for us. And when we were looking at how we're building out our tools and where it will be stored, uh, it was a, a driving factor in our decision to initially use Amazon Web Services for storage, um, in addition to uh, Esri's ArcGIS Online. Um, you know, we, we can do regular testing of the data to make sure it's uh, largely hacker proof. Um, we, we continue to monitor any leaks on the system and we regularly check up with our partners access, uh, you know, uh, uh, logins, et cetera. So, so, not, so people aren't sharing logins or, you know, using a, a name and password that are the same. But we can also go to another degree of data privacy. And, and I think that point was raised by you, John Baptiste, about where the data might be stored. And we have a lot of flexibility there. For the purpose of the initial pilot, we did use the, the Amazon web servers um, and ArcGIS online that are based in the US. But we also have servers now in India for our partners in India to keep the data in country. We actually have a partner in, in Tanzania that keeps it on a closed server so the data doesn't leave the country given the, the, the country's data requirements. Uh, it just it requires, frankly, a different degree of, of technical support in country um, that sometimes isn't appropriate at a first stage or a pilot because that means an investment in in-country infrastructure agreements, et cetera. Um, but as we scale, obviously, and as it relates to formal data, it becomes more critical for that data to be stored and managed by the, the government entities. Thank you, thank you, Frank. Uh, now I would like to address the next question to Leonard, and it's uh, we have a couple of questions regarding the ITP and also some questions about the upcoming ITP for for Liberia and in Zimbabwe. And the questions are, who can uh, participate in the ITP? Uh, that's one. And the second one is, how can you use the experiences from this ITP, like in Rwanda and in Kenya, like just to share with us? How can you use this experience in uh, another ITP? Over to you, Lennart. Thank you. Uh, regarding, regarding the ITP that we've heard the example from today, uh, government officials, members from the civil society working in the land sector, members from NGOs can apply. Uh, the whole thing uh, is about getting the collaboration between these groups. So that's, that's the, the answer to the first one. And uh, the other one, 
as, as you heard, we are having the ITP program that runs for five years. Now we have another ITP program coming up, which is specifically, uh, which, is, which is really based on the experiences that we have had for this program. But now we're forming a new program in Liberia and Zimbabwe, where we're having 15 participants from each country. And we are, are looking, at, looking at a specific area where we can do work over time. Uh, and um, I think the experiences that we can bring from what we've heard today from, from Rwanda, the, the cadaster tool, uh, is something that we will definitely bring on to <laughs> uh, the upcoming program. Um, so, but, but the big difference is really uh, that we're just having two countries and bigger groups, uh, and that and the programs will run for three years instead of five years. Thank you, Leonard. Uh, we have uh, some, some more and more, let's say, technical questions to Cadasta. Uh, one is, uh, is the Cadasta tool, if it has the capability of recording uh, joint tenure rights? Uh, so I'm thinking may maybe, Frank, if you can uh, answer that question and share some other areas of use for your tool, different types of data, if that's possible. Sure. Thanks for that, Kent. And one of the things that um, you know has has made the tool so useful, the tools that we're using so useful, is the flexibility in the data models and how quickly we can develop them on the fly. And you know, one of the things that was exciting for us, you know, working on the ITP was that we did the training, but then Jean Baptiste and his team were able to pick up the configuration, etc. And along those lines. Um, you know, we can map it out. So you're, you're, you're capturing joint tenancy. You might be capturing overlapping rights of different types. Um, we can, can and do uh, look to align where appropriate with the ISO standard land administration domain model and the country specific subsets. So that data could flow directly into a national system, you know, via an API or whatever might be feasible, or if the legislation's not yet there for an API, it could be printing out in hard copy and then then delivering uh, that, that, that document. Um, and and that's where we've seen a, a range of use cases. You know, as as you alluded to, Kent, um, that data kept captured being used, whether it's in in India and leading directly towards a state issued formal right. Or maybe land is a small component. You know, we work with a number of partners that they're looking at land, but because it relates to smallholder productivity and value chains. So they're collecting data about the tenancy and rights, but they're collecting 100, 200 additional data points relating to the agricultural use, productivity, et cetera. Um, and that's where we're, we're very flexible with our partners to design your approach and tools for data collection to meet the needs. And while land is a driving factor for us, we know that it's often just a contributing factor towards broader development goals. Thank you, Fram. Uh, I just had a message from Jean Baptiste. He is trying to connect another laptop to be able to uh, respond, some, respond to some more questions because we have uh, actually a bunch of questions for, for Jean Baptiste. But uh, while we wait for Jean Baptiste to connect his other laptop, uh, I'd like to, to answer one of the questions uh, myself. It's related to how does Landmetriet measure uh, the impact on the SDGs uh, in relation to, to work effort? And you remember I showed you a diagram. Uh, we're putting the SDGs, uh, in this case, uh, the ones uh, we contribute to in the bilateral project in Rwanda. And it is a relative scale, rel relative only within the project, meaning that that scale is, we consider each a SDG and which one do we contribute more to? And how much work effort do we put into each SDG in this specific project? So the scale is relative only within the project. And it's no exact measurement. It's a, an open discussion. Uh, it's looking at the outcomes of the project, the outputs, the results we see, for example, if it's all the way to, to an outcome of change behavior, people are, like Leonard mentioned the, the example of the uh, collaborations. 
as a result of the ITP programs, you get the example of, of Tanzania. And, and in this case, we have similar you know, results in, in Rwanda. But going back to the Tanzania example, we can see a change in behavior where NGOs and government organizations is actively working together, contacting each other, which is a new behavior. A couple of years ago, they didn't do that. They didn't even know each other. So that's what we consider an outcome uh, which would contribute to the SDG uh, for building uh, efficient partnerships. Uh, other ways can be to, to measure data collected, for example, with the, with the cadaster tool uh, and making this data available for not only the collectors and the organization collecting it, maybe also like you mentioned, Frank, uh, putting it into a nationwide system or uh, having it uh, accessed by some other organization that is uh, contributing to making data available to people. So the short answer is this Scale is only relative within each project. Thank you. Uh, let me see. I'd like to direct another question to you, Frank. Uh, can the use of developed tools reduce the cost of registration, uh, land transaction formalization, which is uh, decreed high by the local community, like rural landowners? Potentially. <laughs> um, and it, it, it's really, you know, it varies by country and depends what the driving factors are on the costs uh, for registration. Sometimes it's official government fees and what they're based on, you know, could really vary. Um, in other cases, it might be related to that cost of data collection, and we can look at what are the standards for that data collection. If you're requiring centimeter level precision, there's going to be a natural cost and time component there that's going to drive up, uh, um, drive up the, the cost of a transaction. If, however, you're, you're looking at a more fit for purpose approach, lower, lower, lower level accuracy, or a more flexible land administration framework where you're not dependent on a government set surveyor or a licensed surveyor, um, then we'll see the costs really drop. For, uh, for, for us, we see that capture of spatial data is, is often the primary contributing factor, um, but also the one that perhaps deserves the most thought about, is it relevant for the context? Thank you, Frank. And I'm happy to see that we have Sean Baptiste back with us. Thank you, Sean Baptiste, for solving the, the technical issues. Uh, I'll throw a question at you right away, uh, and it is, what are the government efforts to communities to value land registrations? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we were focusing on um, awareness raising since 2014. With public awareness, uh, uh, we organize every year some, it is called uh, Land Week, where we organize some public campaigns. And also, we, we bring our land services at local level, where we go with our uh, equipped buses, equipped with. Uh, laptops, internet, uh, printers, and so on. And we move from our office to the local community in order to, to show them an example uh, that land services are possible and they can use uh, uh, the old channels that, because the land services are, de are decentralized at the, the lowest level, uh, which is the sector. It's a sector is it not a big, uh, people can move from their homes to the sector very easily. So we try to raise the, their awareness so that they can understand the importance of formalizing uh, the land transactions. And also we try to explain them the consequences that can that they, they can face if they don't formalize their the 
their land transactions because they can lose their money if uh, someone uh, buys a land and it is not it is not recorded in the land register the it means that the we, we, we still we still have the the former land owner and that land that uh, land uh, former land owner uh, can uh, give that land as a collateral in the bank and the bank if the land owner fails to pay the bank the bank can can take uh, that land and, and and sell it to in order to get the the money. So uh, we focus on uh, awareness basic. Also, we are trying to see how uh, we can reduce land transaction fees uh, because many people, uh, they are complaining that uh, uh, the transaction fee is relatively high, but also uh, the sensitization is the key because there are some many people who are, are rich enough to pay uh, the transaction fee, but they they can buy a land and they spend uh, two years or three years without going to formalize the land transaction. So that that what we are doing in order to make um, the community to be aware of the importance of uh, formal land legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Jean Baptiste. And I will throw you another question right away. Uh, the question is quite straightforward. Uh, does Rwanda have traditional leaders? And if so, what, what type of documents does the local leader give to the people? In Rwanda, we don't have traditional uh, leaders like in other countries, maybe like in Ghana or in other uh, countries of DRC. Uh, we have only those lo local that, that I was talking about. They are elected people. Uh, they are. Uh, they belong on the administrative structure of the country. The the village is the, the lowest entity administrative entity in Rwanda. The those leaders are elected from the the community. Uh, to lead them, uh, they have a mandate of uh, maybe of three three years. If uh, yes, it's, they have a mandate of three years. So uh, they, there is a committee at the village level, composed of five members. There is a chair, the chairperson, and the other four members, including. The representative of, of women, the representative of uh, youth, and also the representative of uh, the in charge of security and so on. So, uh, what the document they, that they give to the to those who approach them in order to approve their land transaction, they don't provide any land document. Uh, they they only approve the transaction is the witness the, the, that the transaction, the land transaction uh, happened on that particular parcel. They, they used to sign uh, on the sale agreement. The, I mean the, the sale agreement between the buyer and the seller. But according to Rwandan law, the sale agreement that is uh, recognized by the law is that uh, which is uh, done before the land notary. And you have uh, different land notaries uh, at sector. We have uh, uh, 416 sectors in Rwanda, and in each sector we have a land notary. And the district also have land notaries. We have also at the provincial level uh, in our offices, the Land regist uh, the, uh, register of land titles. They all, they have also the, the quality of uh, land notary. Also, at the headquarter, our DG uh, and chief registrar, uh, she she has the power of uh, land, land notary. So, 
One more question for you, Jean Baptiste. Uh, what is the total share of land that has been formalized in Rwanda? The total land that was uh, formalized. Uh, if we look, if we look at the the data that we have in our land register during the systematic land registration, uh, we recorded information, land information, uh, and the total. As I mentioned, we demarcated more uh, ten point four million. But currently, because of subsequent transactions, we we have now 11.5 million of parcels uh, demarcated. But we, if we we, uh, uh, we talk of uh, formal uh, land registration, uh, we have uh, parcels with complete information. We have uh, around we have around 10, 10 million of parcels with with uh, complete information. Uh, and we still have 1.5 million, million of parcels, uh, which were not uh, claimed by, by anyone. It, it means that we, we demarcate them, and also they have the, the parcel numbers, but anyone claimed that land. So we, we have zero information in the, in the land register. Uh, but for those who are formally registered, we can say that we have 10, around 10 million of parcels that are from our register. Thank you, Jean Baptiste. And before we're out of time, I would like to throw a question on you, Frank. Uh, it's from Tanzania. Uh, the question is that they have been using the MUST tool for registration in Tanzania. And this question is, have you come across this tool and can you explain the difference or similarities between the cadastre tool and the MAS tool? And also, which one is more user friendly uh, to collect the poor person's land rights? Okay, great, great question. And and without looking at MAST recently, I'll say cadastre is the most user friendly, but that's that's a biased response. Uh, we do know the MAST tool quite, quite well. In fact, before I joined or helped join, uh, help found cadastre, I'd worked with USAID and helped design that approach and testing out of that tool. And it, it really served its purpose in proving out that community-based mobile data collection can lead to incremental strengthening and securing of rights. Um, and, and from that perspective, it's been a fantastic tool and we've seen it continue to be updated and adding the community server, et cetera. But I'd say the, the primary difference um, between our tools is really the flexibility. You know, Cadasta was uh, designed our tools with an idea of a, a range of use cases and a range of geographies. And I know MAST was, you know, originally defined for a very specific use case and adapting it for others is a little bit more, more time consuming. The other point I'd add is that, you know, our Cadasta tools fit into a much broader uh, technology ecosystem. We can lever, because we build off of the Esri suite of technology, we can leverage those other modules and components that other partners might need on a very, you know, uh, sporadic basis. Capturing drone imagery isn't a part of everyone's workflow, but for those that it is, we have a module for processing that drone imagery and turning it into a geo-reference ortho photo that can be used. Um, if you want to go into advanced spatial analysis and really get into the science of GIS, you know that, that's easy to do in our ecosystem. Um, and finally, I think the number of, of users, you know, Esri is a ubiquitous tool. So finding someone with a degree of training in it in country is always possible. So even if you're a partner that's gone and collected your data and now you're thinking, how do we build out uh, you know, an advanced analysis? Almost certainly there's someone locally with that, with that knowledge that you can access and, and, and get that service. You're not dependent on an external actor or very, very niche technical skill set. Uh, so just some quick thoughts and admittedly, I haven't messed with MAST in, in, a, in a year or so, so it might be a little bit dated. Thank you, and um, time is flying, and uh, we need to wrap up this webinar. Uh, 
I thank, of course, the audience and our technical team, Sydney Madeleine, who, who made this work, actually. And thank you all the presenters, especially Sean Baptiste, managing to, to connect despite the lockdown in Kigali, despite the power outage, he still managed to answer a lot of questions. So Sydney will share the presentations and uh, it means we'll, we'll get in touch with all of you and we'll thank you very much for the interest and the number of questions. And I have a lot of questions we didn't have time to answer. So thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all.